Welcome to Sir David Simmons, His Life in Focus. I'm Sherwood McCaskey. Thanks for joining us. In our last program, Sir David regaled us with memories of his childhood days, what influenced his life, his interest in athletics and experiences of his schools. In this episode, he speaks of leaving Barbados to pursue studies in the United Kingdom. You will learn of a number of the individuals he came into contact with, experiences of London during the 1960s, and the good work of the West Indian Students' Union. Never forget the afternoon that I got the acceptance letter from, from LSE. I took it to show my headmaster, Mr. Newsom, and um, he called his deputy, Mr. Critchlow, and said, Percy, someone's going to be a communist. You're going to this place where Lasky is uh, a powerhouse. He's done a school economics. That was my introduction in Barbados to LSE. That was supposed to be a place of communism. Never found that at all. The most liberal educational institution that you could come across. Um, you had all kinds of societies. Yes, you had a communist society. You had a labor society, conservative society. Um, we had a West Indian society, all kinds of things. But LSE was a wonderful experience. Um, met some important people uh, who became important in later years. The first, the first Minister of Water Resources in South Africa after apartheid. Um, he, he was there, he was president of the Law Society, Carter as well. Ozzie Harding, who was a senator in Jamaica and an attorney general. He was there. Uh, our own renowned and irreplaceable Steve Emptich was completing his studies at LSE when I went in 1960. Steve did very well and did wonders for Barbados in the Ministry of Finance in subsequent years. Um, yeah, had a good time. Um, London in the 60s was a place to be. Swinging 60s. <laughs> Everything was happening in London. And even though, you know, um, as a, a young West Indian in London in 1916, the impact of migration from the Caribbean to England had not yet uh, fully uh, established itself. For example, when I went, I had two cousins who lived down in South East London, and Hammy Gill, who had been at law school with me but was doing medicine at St. Mary's Hospital. He back here, I uh, practices in, 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 um, in Black Rock now. Uh, Hammy was there, my, my good friend. He, he met me and helped me to settle in and so on. But, you know, we didn't have many other, I didn't have any other Barbadian friends at the time. I got to know people um, through two things. The West Indian Student Center. And it's an important institution because in those days when we were all colonies, the governments of those colonies got together and funded in England the West Indian Student Center as a place of resort for West Indian students so that we could go there on a Friday evening or a Saturday night or something and first of all you had a good meal three course West Indian meal cooked by a Bajan Miss Prescott, and the drinks were mixed by a Jamaican known as Martin. Um, and you know, the first place I had Red Stripe, for example, I was there. And um, we you used to gather a lime there. 
In the summer, there was a cricket team, West Indian Students Center cricket team. Robert Williams was, when I first went, captain. Robert is Sir Dennis Williams' last brother, still alive. Sir Dennis and Boogles and uh, James. He's the last of the Williams boys. Uh, excellent cricketer. He was captain. Then when he came back home around 1962, I took over and I captained the, the team until 1968. And it was a team of West Indian students. You know, we had one or two quasi students uh, to strengthen things. <laughs> and uh, we, 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 we played all around London and we went, we played every year at Sandhurst, we played at Eton, and we played at Oxford. Uh, and we used to enjoy these coach rides and so on, and the girlfriends would come and whatever. We had a ball. Uh, but the, the West Indian Student Center was important as a meeting point for us students, and we were able to discuss current affairs in England as well as we, we, we pontificated on what was happening 4,000 miles away in the Caribbean. We thought we had the answers to all the problems in the Caribbean, joke. But you know, it, it was a good intellectual exercise. And um, you, you made some lasting friendships. P.J. Patterson is my friend to this day. We were not only at LSE together, but um, he was a pillar of the student center. And the small boys, um, Richard and, and Hugh, uh, who were studying law, did very well when they went back to Jamaica. Hugh was at one time Minister of Finance, and Richard is a, a prominent, prominent lawyer. Uh, Adolf Edwards, Dr. Adolf Edwards. And we had friends from Guyana, Red Pereira, yeah, a uh, number, number of good, good friends who have remained friends until today. Yeah, you know, when we had the ash fall recently and Barbados was blanketed for two or three days, all of a sudden one afternoon we got a call. So this number come up, 876 something on there. And he said to Maria, somebody calling from Jamaica. I don't recognize the number. So I answered. And he says, you good? I said, yeah. He said, we're just checking. Everything all right? He said, we blanketed with the ash. He said, but you're safe. I said, yeah. He said, good, thanks. Hugh, here, I'm gone. A Hugh Small calling to see if I was, you know, I was uh, okay. Or Maria and I were okay. Because she knew him well. Um, yeah, so the, the, I had um, on the social side at the West Indian Student Center, there was an aspect of my life then that helped get me through university. I, I was funded by my, by my father. And what I tell you now will shock you. You know what I existed on in 1960, 35 pounds a month. 35 pounds. Multiply that by $4.80, the pound was worth $4.80. I, I still, I, I was still able to buy cigarettes. No, but the weight of um, the, it was, it was a room and a little kitchenette. Two pound five a week. Two pound five shillings a week. So I wasn't too badly off. But I supplemented that 35 pounds. Because I found a band, Ivan Chin, Guyanese drummer. And he put together some of us in a band. Ivan Chin Calypso, West Indian Calypso Band or something he called it. And we used to play on weekends. There was a guy who played across sax. He 
it, he used to be with Joey Lewis. In fact, he, when Joey Lewis started his band uh, of young boys, Horace, the fellow's called Horace Small. Horace was the alto sax player, and he was in England then, probably 21, 22, by the time I met him. And he played alto sax. Um, a guy called Carl Constantine played piano. Uh, there was there, there was a bass player, Clive something, but I, I remember. And we had a couple of guitarists and so on. Steve Shaman from Trinidad and one or two other boys. And we used to go around, particularly at the West Indies Student Centre, playing for dances and we played there on Saturday nights and the students would come and dance and whatever, had a good time. And then there was the um, British Council Hostel in Hans Crescent in Knightsbridge. We played there, they had a large dance hall. We played there for students and so on too. So on a, if I played a Saturday night, I could get three punks. So the rent covered. <laughs> See? Yeah. yeah I, um, those, were, those were good days, really good days. Yeah. And you didn't have a care in the world. Nor chick, nor child. What about the study of law? In introducing this, Sir David backtracks and praises a number of his teachers here in Barbados. Three years for the LLB. Then in, in those days, the LLM was a two-year course. I, I spent it two years. I had some, some wonderful teachers. Throughout my uh, years of education, law school, wonderful teachers. Mr. Newsom, Mr. Critchlow, Percy Critchlow, Fab Hoyas, the incomparable Fab Hoyas, uh, Wax Gooding, um, Val McCormick, who taught French, who subsequently became ambassador to the OAS and so on. And then at LSC, um, it was said and it has been said more recently by Lord Grabiner that the LSC Law Department in the 60s was the the best uh, in England. Um, you know, I, I had the benefit of people like Stanley the Smith who taught constitutional law, uh, Bill Wedderburn, Lord Wedderburn, uh, he taught company law, uh, and Professor Gower, Jim Gower, Wheatcroft, Ash Wheatcroft, who taught income tax, J.A.G. Griffith of the politics of the judiciary fame and so on. Some good, good, good. I had some good tutors, good teachers, and I wish to think that I never let them down. On completion of his studies in the UK, Sir David enjoyed a short stint teaching. I wanted to, always wanted to come back to Barbados in 1965. And my father, truth be told, was pushing me hard. My, hurry up and do the bar and come back. And uh, I thought I wanted more time, more experience. And certainly when I looked in the mirror, I was about so big. I had a little baby face. And I kept saying to myself, but who would give me a case? I go back to the look like this. I need to mature a bit more. And um, so I, I got some jobs lecturing, teaching law. I enjoyed, enjoyed those days, yeah. At Woolwich Polytechnic, which is now South Bank University. And um, it was a place called West London College. And I taught criminal law and company law and commercial law. Um, and I enjoyed it. Um, and that, as I said, that helped me to mature. And then I, I decided I want to come home and they wanted me to come back home. So I came home in 1968. Marie and I had got married in 1966, on the day that England won the World Cup football, July 30th. And um, we, came, we came home. Gavin was born in October 67, and we brought him home in 68. For Christmas, we spent a couple of weeks here. And then I said, okay, I'll come back. I went back to London, did the bar, 
and packed up and came back in 1970. In 1970, the, the bar was small and the profession was not fused. You had the solicitors and you had the barristers. I was a barrister. And if you were going in the high court, the practice was that the solicitor would instruct the barrister. Um, so I had a year of that. And then in 1971, the uh, profession was fused. And so a barrister could do solicitor's work, a solicitor could do barrister's work, and so on. But you had to, you had to depend on solicitors for your briefs for the high court, uh, and of course the court of appeal. The number of us who practiced as barristers, I can't think would have been no, no more than 20 or 30. No more than 20 or 30. But it was a very friendly profession. If you didn't know something, you went to a senior and said to him, you know, something can't quite work out in whatever. And if he knew, he didn't know. Let me explain that to you. He would, he would do it. And we all benefited from that, inter that uh, interchange of um, information. Nowadays, I hear that things are different. Uh, everybody keeps things to their chest and they don't. That's not right. That's not right. Um, but I had a good practice. I had prepared myself in a way when I did the masters uh, with a view to doing heavy civil work. So I did company law for the masters and income tax law. And when I came back, I uh, realized that I couldn't break into those fees at all. They were controlled by a small, small group. And anyhow, I didn't didn't phase me one way or the other. I practiced a lot of criminal law. I represented a lot of poor people. And um, all over this country in magistrate courts. And so I'm particularly in St. Joseph, I, I have to say that I had uh, a very heavy practice in, in, in District F, St. Joseph. And there, there was one character down there. Uh, who used to be singing my praises all the time. You know, you get these characters, a fellow called Brown Boy. And um, practice in the country had its benefits too, because uh, seldom would you leave Horsen and come back home unless you had some fruit and some vegetables and a couple of yams or something, you know. And I love practicing in the country. Uh, but I did a lot of criminal work. And in my time, I did, in those days, you know, murders were few and far between. And I ended my career with 33 murders. And I got not guilty verdicts in 32. Uh, either at first instance or on appeal. I had a good time in the Court of Appeal, won a lot of cases in the Court of Appeal. Um, and a number of us in 1970 were young practitioners, inexperienced in law and in politics, but fiercely committed to the advancement of Barbados and the improvement of the status of poor people. Johnny Cheltenham, Louis Tao, Billy Miller, all of us. But as I say, we needed some experience. 
Well, experiences of dare school and fools were learning, learning no other, right? One of the first big cases that I did was in St. Vincent as junior to Henry. Henry Ford opened his chambers to me when I came back, had a place for me and helped me greatly. But we had this case. It concerned an island in the Grenadines called Myro, M-A-Y-R-E-A-U, owned by the Eustace family of St. Vincent. And a man called Fuller and others, including two Barbadians, wanted to buy or get this, this island from the Eustace family. So Bree and Henry and myself, Bree St. John, Henry and myself, went down to St. Vincent fighting this case. And we were down there for about two and a half weeks. We know that election is due in 1971. St. John is the leader of the Barbados Labour Party. And one day he says to me, Simmons, may you go run? You have to run. He said, but we run where? He said, I run in St. Philip. I said, like, I, I've only just come back. I've got to get my practice going. Said, man, don't worry about that, man. The exposure will do you good. and You, um, you will get some cases from appearing on platforms and so on. Man, you've got to run. As I keep saying, green as grass, I agree. I know St. Philip North was a place that the Labour Party had not won. The Labour Party had not won St. Philip. In the days when there were, when there were annual elections, Grantley Adams ran up there and never won. Now who would David Simmons come now in 1970, 71, to try to win? Can't win. Neville Maxwell, who had been at large with me, uh, he ran against me for the Democratic Labour Party. He won, won handsomely. Uh, and of course, the Labour Party was thrashed. We lost 18 6. But it was an important learning experience for people like Louis, Johnny, and myself. And so we stayed with it, stayed with the people, did what we had to do in the years intervening. And by the time the election came in 1976, we were ready. And uh, 1976 was a phenomenal year. It started with the, the year before, or to be especially accurate, started even before 1975. Because what happened with Neville Maxwell that eventually led to his leaving Barbados and my um, running for the seat and so on, had its genesis in 1971 elections. On the Saturday before the 1971 election, Mr. Errol Barra flew a light airplane over Barbados and dropped, must be about 10,000 copies of the Democrat newspaper, the organ of the Democratic Labour Party, all over Barbados. And in, those pub in that publication, Henry Ford and Bree St. John were libeled, badly libeled. And they insisted on suing the Democrat, Limited, and Neville Maxwell, the editor, uh, to have their reputation vindicated. I appeared in the matter uh, for Henry with Bill Hanshaw and Jack, Jack there and Tom represented me. Um, and we, we won eventually. They got like 35,000 and 30,000 out of damages. A lot of money in the early 70s. And 
the Democratic, the, 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 the Democrat newspaper and Neville Maxwell never tried to settle the damages. And Henry and Bree were insistent that we had to get the money because Bree lost his seat in 1971, not by a lot. And as the judge said in the case, Hancho, you know, you don't really know to what extent that label contributed to the loss of the seat. Um, so, of course, uh, being uh, a human being, you, you would want to ensure that you got your just desserts. And we pursued the Democrat and sold it out. And Maxwell um, was declared bankrupt. And he, he left Barbados in the dead of night, one night. Uh, all of a sudden, the seat of the Speaker of the House becomes vacant in St. Philip. And the people did not think that the Democratic Labour Party had done enough to save Maxwell. And that's another story. I can't get into that one tonight. Rest assured, we shall get into that one in our next episode. This has been Sir David, his life in focus. I'm Sherwood McCaskey. Thanks for staying with us. Mm -hmm.